But uh, my topic uh, today, and this is the last direct topic that has anything to do with Lincoln or the, the war to prevent Southern independence, as I call it, is uh, the classical liberal states' rights tradition. And um, the, the, the phrase states' rights is sometimes uh, used synonymously with federalism, uh, decentralized government, you know, basically it means essentially the same thing. And uh, a lot of people have a misconception of what it is because the whole study uh, of states' rights, uh, in philosophically, uh, you know, in, uh, and in political science literature, has been pretty much ignored for a long, long time, if not ignored, uh, misrepresented. Uh, some people have, told, have asked me questions in light of my Lincoln writings. Um, they'll say things like, well, the, uh, uh, the South or the Confederate government or whatever, somebody in the South, I'll mention some prominent politician, he voted in favor of some federal law, and they'll name some federal law, and they'll say, how can you square that with his support of states' rights? And uh, the answer is easy, that so-called states' rights had nothing to do with opposition to all federal law. Uh, the, uh, I think of the original, uh, uh, one of the uh, most famous originators of this idea of states' rights as being Thomas Jefferson. You know, long before uh, <clears throat> Lincoln or Jefferson Davis or any of these people came on the scene, it was uh, Jefferson. And um, <clears throat> the basic idea, uh, which was also shared by Madison as, as a young man, was that the citizens of the states uh, ought to have uh, the sovereignty vested in them, the sovereignty over government invested in them, and that they ought to have some vehicle, if they're going to have a central government, they ought to have some vehicle for deciding whether or not what the central government is doing is, is uh, legitimate or not, is constitutional or not. It doesn't mean there should be no federal legislation or, they're to or you're totally opposed to the having a federal government. It never meant that in the eyes of Jefferson, Madison, uh, or anywhere else. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the way Madison described it was uh, dual sovereignty. He used the phrase dual sovereignty. And uh, what he meant was that the original system of government set up by the American founders uh, well, they delegated certain powers to the central government, and in theory, the whole purpose was of, of government was supposed to be to protect the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the way they, they set it. And sometimes that would involve protecting the citizens from <clears throat> state and local tyrannies. But where the duality comes in is the, the lion's share of governmental uh, authority, if you will, governmental functions, was to be left at the state and local levels because they always understood that the biggest threat to freedom, uh, the wolf at the door, as the way I put it recently, would be the central government. That would always be the big threat to freedom. Petty local tyrannies are bad enough, <clears throat> but you, can always, you always have an exit. You don't have to live in a particular town, city, state. You have options. But with the central government, the options are much more scarce. You have to leave the entire country. And so the real threat to tyranny would, all, would always come um, mostly from the central government. And so the Tenth Amendment, for example, gives all, you know, everything that is not the uh, responsibility of the central government is left up to the citizens and the states respectively. And, and that is how they were to uh, uh, control what the central government did. It's called dual sovereignty. Another word for states' rights. Now, of course, since the, uh, since the 1860s, this has been uh, pretty much ignored, uh, associated with racism or slavery, uh, which is a sort of a rhetorical gimmick uh, that's used because, of course, certainly in Jefferson's day, it had nothing to do with that um, <coughs> at all. And so uh, that's the topic uh, for today, the, tr the truth about states' rights. And uh, I might as well, this handout that I gave you, this is section one of the Kentucky Resolve of 1798. And what this is was when the, uh, the Adams administration, John Adams administration, passed, uh, ha with the Congress, passed the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. It made it literally illegal to criticize the government. 
it was illegal, you could be thrown in prison for criticizing the Adams administration. And the law applied to the vice president, who was Thomas Jefferson at the time, uh, didn't apply to, uh, and, and, and there were prosecutions, but the only people ever prosecuted under the, uh, the Sedition Act were members of Jefferson's political party. None of, none, nobody who was a member of the opposing party or any other party was ever prosecuted under this. And it literally did make it illegal to criticize the government. So it was a, it was a censorship law. And so, uh, you know, here's this relatively new central government making criticism of the government illegal. You know, what could be more illiberal than that? And of course, people like Jefferson were uh, tremendously alarmed at this. And so uh, what uh, Jefferson did was uh, he authored this Kentucky Resolve, which is much longer than this. This is just the first section. And he did it anonymously at first, but then later on he admitted that he was the author. And James Madison uh, authored something almost identical to this called the Virginia Resolve or Virginia Resolution of 1798. And, uh, you know, you can read it as well as I can, but, but this was a response to the, the uh, Sedition Act, which made it uh, illegal to criticize the central government. Uh, it resolved that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the, on the principles of unlimited submission to their general government. How about that? Uh, that's what they uh, clearly stated, but by that compact under the style and title of a constitution for the United States and of amendments thereto, they constituted a general government for special purposes, delegated to that government certain definite powers, reserving each state to itself the residuary mass of right to their own self-government, and that whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. And so th this is the best statement I know of, of what states' rights meant to people like Jefferson and Madison and, and other, other people at the time. It didn't meant opposition to all federal law. It didn't mean uh, defense of slavery and so forth. You see, the advocates of, of uh, unlimited centralized governmental power have used this language of racist uh, de you know, defense of slavery to, uh, to demean and denigrate the idea that the citizens can have some control over their central government. Now, they don't want the citizens to have control of the central government, and so therefore they have uh, done this for generations. They have, they have uh, uh, propagandized against this, and they've been so effective in doing this that it was 100 years before a book would be written on this. There was a book about two years ago published called Reclaiming the American Revolution by William J. Watkins, which is an excellent book. And uh, it was the first book in 100 years to be published on the issue of the Kentucky and Virginia Resolves. And uh, so I highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in, these, in this whole issue. It's very well written. Uh, I think he has an article or two on the Mises website or on lewrockwell.com also, uh, Watkins does. And so, but this is slowly uh, creeping out of the, uh, the, uh, the dustbin of history here. And uh, one of the points I'd like to make about this is that this understanding of the federal compact, this understanding was understood by citizens north and south. This was not, since it came from Jefferson and Madison, it was not just a, uh, a, a Virginia thing or, or a southern states' rights thing. It was north and south. Uh, for example, when Jefferson became president, the British started uh, confiscating American ships. They were at war with France, and they, they, were, they started uh, conscripting sailors for, for their army, for their navy, and, and s stealing American ships. And, uh, and uh, Jefferson didn't know what to do about it other than to ha impose a trade embargo uh, prohibiting ships from engaging in the transatlantic trade. And this was horribly harmful to the New England economy, uh, which was very, uh, very much trade dependent. And so uh, the New Englanders responded to this by, by uh, using Jefferson's own language from the Kentucky Resolve to say that we are not going to abide by the trade embargo. We're going to continue trading with the Europeans and take our chances uh, out there. And so the, both houses of the Massachusetts legislature uh, issued formal denunciations of this trade embargo. 
um, denouncing it. They called it, quote, unjust, oppressive, and unconstitutional. While this state maintains its sovereignty and independence, there's that sovereignty and independence again. Uh, they didn't say uh, anything about the whole people. Imagine that. All the citizens can find protection against outrage and injustice in the strong arm of state government. Okay, and they said the embargo was, quote, was not legally binding on the citizens of the state of Massachusetts. So they nullified it, just like the South Carolinians issued this statement that nullified the uh, tariff of abominations, which I talked about yesterday. This was long before that. This was the, the South Carolinians were doing what people in Massachusetts did 25 years earlier uh, with this. Um, Connecticut, state of Connecticut, said that this embargo law is quote, incompatible with the Constitution of the United States and it encroaches upon the immunities of the state. Okay, and, it's, and then its legislature directed all state government officials, quote, to deny any official aid or cooperation in the, in the execution of the act aforesaid. Rhode Island issued a similar proclamation. Then when the War of 1812 broke out, the same uh, New England Federalists, you know, the Federalist Party, uh, they considered this to be mostly a dispute between Jefferson's party and the British. That's what they said anyway. And they did everything they could to uh, disassociate, disassociate themselves from the war and to not participate in, in the War of 1812. Um, the Connecticut State Assembly said this, that paraphrasing this Kentucky resolve once again, they said, but it must not be forgotten that the state of Connecticut is a free, sovereign, and independent state. And they spell the words free, sovereign, and independent in big capital letters. Maybe I'll show you how. I'll pull this off here and show you how it, uh, how it looks. See right there where my finger is. It's, uh, uh, and that's in the original. I didn't add the big capital letters. That was in the original, free, sovereign, and independent state. And that the United States are a confederated and not a consolidated republic. That's totally the opposite of the Lincoln theory of, of, the, of um, the Gettysburg Address. The governor of this state is under a high and solemn obligation to maintain the lawful rights and privileges thereof as a sovereign, free, and independent state as he is to support the Constitution of the United States. And the obligation to support the latter imposes an additional obligation to support the former. And the building cannot stand if the pillars upon which it rests are impaired or destroyed. So they were saying that the, uh, the rights of the states are the pillars of, uh, of American liberty. And that, and that comes first. You can't have liberty protected by the U.S. Constitution unless you also have the, the other, the dual sovereignty. That was their expression of uh, Madison's dual sovereignty, I think. And so uh, it, it was north and south. It was, it was northern states as well as southern states that, that adopted and embraced this doctrine of states' rights and had nothing to do with slavery, racism, or anything like that. Uh, the New England uh, uh, Federalists were so outraged with uh, uh, Jefferson, they so disliked Jefferson, they compared him to the devil, uh, and, and the uh, New England ministers did, uh, and, and worse that they plotted to secede. There was a New England secession movement that lasted for about 10 years. It ended up in a con secession convention in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814. And uh, they voted against secession, but uh, there was never any uh, question of whether secession was legal or not. The only debate was over, is this a wise thing politically and economically for us to secede from uh, the United States? But uh, there was never any uh, question over the right of, of secession. And it was led by uh, Senator Timothy Pickering of Massachusetts, who was uh, George Washington's adjutant general during the American Revolution. He also served as George Washington's Secretary of War and Secretary of State. And he was also the Secretary of State in the John Adams administration. So this was not some crackpot. This was, uh, he may have been a crackpot. He was a politician after all. but. Uh, but he held some pretty high-level jobs. Um, and he was the leader of the, the New England secession movement. And that, that has to be one of the reasons why the Southern Confederates thought, well, naturally, this is a right that all states have. The New Englanders, you know, who are now criticizing us, assume they have that right. Well, why don't we have that right? Uh, another example of um, the use of this uh, states' rights logic was 
When Andrew Jackson had a, a big dispute with the Bank of the United States in the late 1820s, he wanted to defund this. He didn't trust a, a central bank run by politicians in, in the nation's capital. And he eventually won that debate. But uh, the states played a very important part in that. And I alluded to that briefly yesterday. When, uh, when, the, when the Bank of the United States opened up two branches in Ohio, <clears throat> the state of Ohio uh, imposed a tax of $50,000 a year per branch to try to tax the Bank of the United States out of its borders, to just bankrupt it and get it out of there. It also issued resolutions that were kind of similar to these resolutions from Connecticut and Massachusetts regarding the embargo uh, in the early 1800s. And uh, the, the Ohio legislature said this, the states have an equal right to interpret the Constitution for themselves, and uh, end quote. And then after that, they withdrew the protection and aid of the laws of the state from the bank. And that's, that's kind of scary if you're a banker. The, the state legislature is saying we're withdrawing the protection of the laws of our state from your bank. That's sort of inviting bank robbers uh, right in. Uh, Indiana and Illinois did the same thing to try to kick the Bank of the United States out as did Maryland and, and, and other states. Um, there's a real interesting story in, in, the, in the book by James Kilpatrick that I mentioned this morning called The Sovereign States. He tells this whole story in great detail of the confrontation between the state of Ohio and the Bank of the United States and how the state of Ohio invoked the states' rights doctrine, the Jeffersonian states' rights doctrine, uh, to make its case against this bank, which it did not want to exist. And the story he tells is sort of an, uh, an amusing part of it. I'll read you the, the amusing part. I think it's amusing anyway. And here's what the state of Ohio did. On the morning of September 17th, <clears throat> um, a man named John L. Harper was sent to, uh, to collect the taxes at the Bank of the United States, which was a precursor to the Fed. He made, Harper made one last request for voluntary payment. When this was denied, he leaped over the counter strode into the bank vaults and helped himself to $100,000 in paper and specie. He then turned this over to a deputy, stuffing this considerable hoard into a small trunk, which the party thoughtfully had come equipped. The trunk, and they put $100,000 in, in a trunk. In a, so they were serious about getting rid of the, the Bank of the United States, and which they eventually did. Andrew Jackson did succeed, but he had a great deal of help from the citizens of the states invoking the Jeffersonian Kentucky Resolve uh, Doctrine. Um, the northern, some northern states also invoked this uh, nullification idea uh, to, to drag their feet or to not enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, a law that Lincoln supported uh, very strongly. And the Fugitive Slave Act, um, there were several of them that were passed over the decades, but the, but the Fugitive Slave Act, the last one was passed in 1850. It, it essentially conscripted uh, citizens of northern states to capture runaway slaves and return them to their owners. That's why the famous Underground Railroad ended up in Canada. If you, were, uh, if you escaped from uh, Mississippi and, 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 and ended up in Pennsylvania, you had a federal bounty on your head. And, uh, and so they, and the, the magistrates in the northern states were paid $10 for deciding that a captured slave should be brought back to his owner. They were paid $5 if they decided he should be set free. So again, there's that understanding of economic incentives that was put in there. And so and some of the northern states uh, were not enforcing this, and they invoked the Jeffersonian dictum of nullification uh, because they were saying, we think this is unconstitutional, therefore we're not going to enforce this. Uh, and uh, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, Lincoln supported the Fugitive Slave Act that they were not enforcing. And in the early days of his administration, he instructed William Seward to get a new law passed through Congress that would nullify these New England nullifiers, that would make it uh, a federal law against nullifying the Fugitive Slave Act, complete with penalties, with, with pen, criminal penalties involved uh, for anybody who attempted to, to not enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. So, so this was uh, uh, you know, widely accepted North and South. That's the first point I wanted to make um, about this. It was not just a, a, a Southern thing. And it kind of, kind of infuriates me when I read people uh, like Harry Jaffa, who I mentioned earlier, uh, saying making statements that this was this idea was invented out of thin air by John C. Calhoun as a defense of slavery. 
that it is simply an insidious lie. It's, it's just not true by any means, any stretch of the imagination. It came long before that. So that's point number one about um, what states' rights is and how it was widely accepted everywhere. Point number two is uh, that I'd like to make uh, this afternoon is uh, how, why it is that so many conservatives especially and some libertarians are really sort of acting in a sort of a uh, like Don Quixote when they wave the Constitution around and, and pledge their their allegiance to the Constitution and are constantly telling us this should be looked at as a sacred document and and if only the government would enforce this Constitution we would all live as free citizens and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the Cato Institute publishes a little pocket-sized version of the Constitution. Everyone here has probably received one. They have mass mailing. They mail they mail them to everybody and uh, all the time. And but the, the underlying assumption seems to be that uh, well, if enough people read the, the actual Constitution, that they will somehow uh, pressure our politicians to enforce the Constitution, and that would mean eliminating at least 95 percent of the federal government today. I would think, if they actually did live by the Constitution. But how is that supposed to happen? How is this supposed to be enforced? How, how on earth uh, is this Constitution? The, the, the Congress now just ridicules the Constitution. I, when I gave a talk in, uh, before Ron Paul's group in Congress. He has something called the Liberty Caucus, and it claims to have 20 or 25 members or so, and uh, about 10 or 12 of them showed up. And I, I gave a talk on my Lincoln book. It was very... It was very uh, very uh, kind of strange to see all these members of Congress walking around uh, the, the uh, uh, House office building with copies of my Lincoln book under their hand without a brown paper bag around it. it was, uh, but, uh, but they all agreed. This Liberty Caucus of 10 or 12 members of the United States Congress, at one point one of them said, uh, you, you can no longer make constitutional arguments here in Congress against government programs. You're not taken seriously at all, and everyone just ignores you. And they all shook their head. Yes, and that's true. And so it's a dead letter. It's a, they'll use the Constitution if it can be used some way to expand state power, but, but they won't use it to limit state power in any way. They just, they just laugh at you. And, and I've seen, I, I was, well, I can recall uh, flipping the channels one night when I couldn't sleep, and uh, C-SPAN was there, and, uh, and an old acquaintance of mine, Roger Pilon, who works at the Cato Institute, was on some hearing uh, in, before the, a U.S. Senate committee and he was making a constitutional argument against some government program. And if I recall right, it was uh, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama uh, at the time who, was, uh, who, who just looked at Pilon and said, he said, we have the power to do this, and so we're going to do it. And he's pretty much saying, the hell with the Constitution. Here's Roger with all his, his research and his law degrees and his, you know, his constitutional arguments. And he just said, we, we, have, the, we have the guns, therefore we're going to do it. It's sort of similar to people who often ask me uh, questions about what, my opinion on the uh, legality of the income tax. And, uh, and my usual response is, it doesn't matter what the legalistic arguments are about whether the income tax is constitutional or not. The government has enough guns with which to enforce income tax collection. Therefore, you have to pay the income tax. It doesn't matter what the law says or what the Constitution, how it came about constitutionally. That's sort of a moot issue. And so... Uh, and, and if you think about it, just think of the, the, uh, the political incentives of this idea that the Constitution will be enforced by someone. How is this going to happen? You have, uh, you have a classic case of concentrated uh, benefits and dispersed cost, where the, the people who benefit from bigger and bigger government programs, uh, they all have a very, very strong interest to lobby for, argue for bigger government because they are the beneficiaries. Who are the losers? Well, it's generally the general public who have to pay for all this and don't benefit necessarily uh, for, from all from the sugar program and, and things like that, sugar price supports, for example. And it's sort of it's something that's been known by political philosophers and now today a public choice economists for, for uh, hundreds of years that when you have a situation under democracy where you have well-organized special interest groups working for bigger and bigger government, and the masses who are the losers or who are harmed by this, the special interests are going to win out. They're the ones who have the incentive to get these things through, to get these things passed, to make the government grow. 
whereas the rest of us are either rationally ignorant, that is, we don't spend any time learning about these things to begin with, and even if we did learn about all this, there's nothing we can do about it. It's too costly for us to organize nationwide political coalitions, for example, to oppose the sugar price support program. It's just not going to happen. And so this is true of the Constitution in general. There's a built-in, what we call a public choice pro uh, problem here, in that it, it can't be self-enforcing. And the Founding Fathers were not so stupid as to think a mere piece of paper would be self-enforcing. How did they think it would be enforced? Well, the, the idea was that most of the, uh, of the governmental functions uh, would be in the hands of the citizens and the states, respectively. The citizens of the states were to be the ones who were to enforce this constitution because, after all, the citizens of the states were sovereign. The central government was created as their agent to be their servant. Government, that government was supposed to be the servant, not the master of the people, like it is today. And so that's how the Constitution was supposed to be enforced, by the citizens of the respective uh, uh, sovereign states. Um, a, a political scientist at Johns Hopkins named Gottfried Dietze uh, wrote a, a great little book called America's Political Dilemma. And that's spelled D-I-E-T-Z-E, Gottfried Dietze. And America's Political Dilemma, he explains this. He says, federalism instituted to enable the federal government to check oppressions by the governments of the states and vice versa, and vice versa, appears to be a supreme principle of the Constitution. So that's his very brief statement of what I've been talking about recently, divided sovereignty. Okay, he goes on to say this, he says, before the Civil War, the nature of American federalism was still a subject of debate. The outcome of the Civil War ended that debate. The nationalists emerged as victors. National power increased as the 20th century approached, along with the disappearance of states' rights. That period was subsequently characterized by an increasing interference with economic freedom and constitutes a constitutional revolution that can well be termed a reversal of the revolution of 1787, end quote. So what Dieter is saying is that the revolution of 1787, the American Revolution, was a states' rights revolution. The system of government set up was a compact of the states where the citizens of the states were sovereign. The Civil War, so-called, was a revolution against that revolution because it did destroy that system. That's why uh, in, in my writings I, I argue every chance I get that uh, Lincoln's war destroyed the Union. It didn't save the Union. It destroyed the voluntary union of the Founding Fathers, and, and it destroyed federalism and states' rights uh, at the same time. It, was, it, it saved the Union geographically, but philosophically it destroyed, uh, it destroyed the Union. Um, and you have uh, uh, big government advocates and imperialists who, who, who weaseled their way into the government, top levels of government, after the turn of the century, uh, who have actually praised this outcome and publicly, Woodrow Wilson is one example. Before Wilson was president, he was a political science professor at Princeton, and he wrote a book called Congressional Government. He wrote another book called Constitutional Government in the United States. And here's what Woodrow Wilson said about this. He said, and he's writing this in an, in an approving tone of voice. He says, the war between the states established this principle that the federal government is, through its courts, the final judge of its own powers, end quote. So it was no longer the citizens of the states who would be the judges of the appropriate powers of the central government. It was the central government itself through its courts that would decide the limits of its own powers. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, most of the founders thought that this would be a disaster, uh, an absolute disaster. It's you know, a classic case of uh, the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, after Jefferson died, probably the most uh, prominent proponent of this view was John C. Calhoun. And uh, the, the book that I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, a, good, a good one to pick up, is called Union and Liberty. The editor is Ross Lentz, L-E-N-C-E. And it, in, it contains his, his book, actually, The Disquisition on Government. And in a few, so if you want to read a good rendition of this Jeffersonian states' rights philosophy, that's where, it is, that's where to read it from. 
And uh, I'd like to share with you just one thing he says, uh, one of his main arguments. Murray Rothbard uh, always, uh, always said that uh, he thought Calhoun was one of America's uh, most brilliant po political philosophers. And, but he is uh, hopelessly trashed and denigrated by uh, the Lincoln cult, uh, and especially Jaffa and the Claremont people and the Straussians. They just despise Calhoun. They, they make up lies about him all the time in, in, in their writings. I don't know where they get some of this stuff. But, but he has no redeeming value at all in their eyes. And here's one of the things about, that Calhoun said about the nature of democracy. That um, He's talking about, he broke, he said, under democracy, you're going to have two groups in society. You're going to have one group that is, are the net taxpayers, people who pay a lot more or pay more than they get back from government. Then the other group is net tax consumers who get more from government benefits than they pay in tax. And he predicted that it is inevitable. It's like one of the iron laws of politics that uh, the, the group of tax, net tax consumers will, will dominate taxpayers, even though they might be actually the different individuals at different times. Sometimes because of elections, you could be a net tax consumer one year and a net tax payer next year. But here's what he says about it. At first, they, he's talking about the people who defend the Constitution and limited government. At first, they might command some respect and do something to stay the encroachment. I guess he, today he would be talking about the Cato Institute and they're handing out a little constitutions. He said, but they would, in the proce progress of the contest, be regarded as mere abstractionists, and indeed deservedly, if they should indulge in the folly of supposing that the party of possession of the ballot box and the physical force of the country could be successfully resisted by an appeal to reason, truth, justice, or the obligations imposed by the Constitution. The end of the contest would be the subversion of the Constitution. And that, boy, that has sure come true, as has it. This was uh, around 1850 that he wrote that Calhoun died in 1850. Um, if you want a good, uh, uh, the, legal, the legal view of the Jeffersonian Constitution, it's a book called View of the Constitution of the United States by St. George Tucker. And it's been recently reprinted, so you can buy it pretty cheaply in paperback online at Amazon or, or in other places. And this was the Jeffersonian view of the Constitution, very popular. Now, who was St. George Tucker? He was a professor of law at William & Mary College. He took the place of Thomas Jefferson's uh, teacher, George, George Wythe, who we have a student here who goes to Wythe College. He pronounces it Wythe, but I... But at the, it's spelled white. There's an E on the end, W-Y-T-H-E. So I'm going to stick with white. I don't, I'm going to even though everybody at your college calls it uh, with. Uh, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, uh, George, George White was. And maybe I'll switch. Well, I'll call him with once and then white second time. Um, well, anyway, St. George Tucker uh, fought in the American Revolution. He was wounded in battle, became a successful lawyer. Uh, he adopted John Randolph. John Randolph of Roanoke. Uh, his mother was uh, widowed, and he adopted John Randolph. Uh, he authored a plan for the abolition of slavery in Virginia in 1796, which was one of the first plans offered anywhere in America for the abolition of slavery. And this, in this book, St. George Tucker uh, said this. He said, the union of the sovereignty of a state with the central government constitutes a state of usurpation and absolute tyranny over the people. He was saying, if you have a union of sovereignty with the central government, meaning if you allow the central government to decide for itself what the limits of its power are to be, well, then you're going to have tyranny. That's, that's, that's what's going to happen. You, you have to have the citizens in control uh, with some mechanism, some practical mechanism, and the one they were talking about was states' rights. Uh, and he went on to say, if, <clears throat> if the unlimited authority of the central state were to change the Constitution itself, the government, whatever be its form, is absolute and despotic. And he believed also that, I'm um, still quoting, the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive to the good and happiness of mankind. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and that's all I'm going to read from that. I don't want to read the whole book or, uh, to you here. It's, uh, that's a sure recipe for putting everyone to sleep. Uh, 
But, uh, but I recommend it to you. It's the Jeffersonian states' rights version of the Constitution. But, of course, this is another one of those things that has been forgotten since 1865 for the most part. And uh, most Americans have been taught the New England version of American history. They haven't been taught the real version. They've been taught that the, the winners always uh, write the history after wars. A contemporary of Tucker's was uh, a United States senator from Virginia named John Taylor, who wrote a book called Tyranny Unmasked that I, that I mentioned yesterday. And a few things he said about this topic in there. He said, uh, being an essential principle for preserving liberty, the Constitution never could have designed to destroy it, to destroy liberty, by investing five or six men installed for life with a power of regulating the constitutional rights of all political departments, end quote. So what he was saying is he thought it would have been an absurdity for the founders to uh, think that, uh, like I said yesterday, five or six government lawyers with lifetime tenure putting the power to defend everyone's liberty in their hands and their hands alone, a Supreme Court, that was craziness. So that was, that was the, the uh, states' rights thinking. That's what states' rights was always about. Always about. It was a mechanism for the citizens themselves to control their central government. Now, a, uh, a, a hardcore uh, uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, could argue, well, this whole history now, this whole period shows that uh, a limited government is impossible. You could, you, you could use the whole American experience to say, well, this, this was the best attempt to have limited government, and despite the best of intentions, uh, that uh, it, well, it sure didn't work. It, it kind of worked until 1865, but then it was uh, destroyed at gunpoint. As soon, I mean, in my view, as soon as the central government became powerful enough to destroy rule by the citizens themselves, it did so. It did so by force of arms. There used to be a lot of uh, uh, conservative and, and libertarian writers and thinkers who wrote a, quite a lot about this because they understood this, this truth. Not so many anymore. A lot of the libertarians, like our friends at the Cato Institute, I think, I think are uh, afraid of being branded as politically incorrect uh, because so they never mention this uh, at all. Uh, they're, they're more concerned with being acceptable to the Washington establishment and to academe than to uh, speaking the truth about history, uh, about this. But that wasn't always true. Uh, back in the older days, uh, Frank Chodorov, one of the famous old right icons, who wrote uh, this great little book, The Income Tax Root of All Evil, he addressed this whole issue of uh, how to suppress tyranny. Uh, and he said this, the real obstacle to tyranny is the psychological resistance to centralization that the state's rights tradition fosters. The citizen of divided allegiance cannot be reduced to subservience. If he is in the habit of serving two political gods, he cannot be dominated by either one. And he spells gods with a small g. Uh, no political authority ever achieved absolutism until the people were deprived of a choice of loyalties. And he goes on to say that it was not by accident that Stalin, Mussolini, and Lenin liquidated any and all competing authorities before consolidating their power, including the church and everything else, not just state governments. Um, he mentioned, Chodorov writes about divided authority. He, talk, he calls Madison's divided sovereignty divided authority. And he says, this, this was nothing less than the bulwark of freedom, for freedom means the absence of restraint. And government cannot give freedom, it can only take it away. The more power the government exercises, the less freedom the people will enjoy. And when the government has a monopoly of power, the people have no freedom. This is the, that is the definition, the very definition of absolutism, uh, monopoly of power. And so Chodorov uh, wrote kindly about states' rights. Uh, second person I'll mention is Ludwig von Mises. In his book, Omnipotent Government, which is for sale right outside this door, I'm sure, uh, he was talking in one passage about um, developments in America and Switzerland. In this one particular passage, I'm going to quote, and about how the growth of government had been occurring in these two, uh, two countries. And he says, new power is accrued not to the member states, but to the federal government. And federal here meaning central government. Every step toward more government interference and toward more planning means at the same time an expansion of the jurisdiction of the central government. Washington and Bern, Bern the capital of Switzerland, 
were once the seats of federal governments. Today, they are capitals in the true sense of the word, and the states and cantons are virtually reduced to the status of provinces. And here's the part that I italicize, where von Mises said, it is a very significant fact that the adversaries of the trend toward more government control describe their opposition as a fight against Washington and a fight against Bern, i.e. against centralization. It is conceived as a contest of states' rights versus the central power, end quote. So to, to Ludwig von Mises, the whole contest over liberty, uh, freedom, was based on opposition to the central government, to the national, what's going on in the national capital, and versus states' rights. Uh, and keep in mind, it didn't mean that there's something called a state that has rights. I've had some Randians in particular uh, annoy the hell out of me with these. The only people have rights. States don't have, you know, the, the, my response is usually a duh to that. The, the, the meaning of states' rights was individuals have a right to collectively band together to oppose tyranny at the central level of government. That's what states' rights mean. It doesn't mean there's something called a state of Alabama that has rights. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Never did mean that. Jefferson never thought that's what it meant. Madison never thought. Nobody ever thought that. Only the Randians seem to think that because they keep emailing me and, and, the, and, these, and the, these indignant tones of their letters uh, as though they've discovered some brilliant point uh, out there. But I, uh, and they don't, writing them back has no effect. They keep saying the same thing over, over and over again. Uh, but uh, Murray Rothbard, a young Murray Rothbard in his early 20s, uh, wrote a letter to Strom Thurmond, the, the late Strom Thurmond, who ran for president in 1948 on the state rights party ticket. And uh, he, wrote, he, wrote this, he wrote this letter. Uh, Murray said, although a New Yorker born and bred, I was a staunch supporter of the Strom Thurmond movement in 19, 1948. He said, but, but the problem with the, the movement was that it focused too excessively on the civil tyranny program. And Murray uh, called the civil rights legislation the civil tyranny legislation because it violated property rights. And Murray, like a lot of other people, thought that, this, that the purpose of this was not, uh, was not justice for, for minorities, but federal control and federal expansion of the bureaucracy. And so Murray went on to say that this program of federal civil rights should be opposed as an affront to property rights and the freedom of association. Uh, and what was really needed was a national as opposed to a regional party to fight, quote, the power-hungry Washington bureaucracy. Uh, so that was, that was his view. And, uh, of course, there have always been uh, the proponents of uh, centralized power. Uh, we wouldn't have all the centralized power that we have today without some very influential proponents. And so I want, I want to read uh, a typical argument from a, a, uh, a political writer who wrote at the, during the same time that von Mises was writing Omnipotent Government, around the same time. So this was a contemporary of von Mises in, in Europe at the time who was making the opposite case, who was making the case for consolidated government. And I'll read you a few things. Uh, well, he, he started out by condemning the impotence and fragmentation of the, the uh, uh, he was referring to Germany here, the provinces. And uh, he referred to the, quote, struggle between federalism and centralization. So this proponent of, of uh, centralized governmental power understood, like Mises did, that the biggest opposition to monopoly government power was federalism and states' rights. Although he was on the other side, he said, "Well, let's, we could eliminate this opposition because we want to consolidate power." And this writer uh, naturally turned to Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address to make his case for the uh, el elimination of states' rights in Germany. And he said, "This: the individual states of the American Union could not have possessed any state sovereignty of their own." For it was not these states that formed the Union. On the contrary, it was the Union which formed a great part of the so-called states, end quote. That was Link, one of Lincoln's theories, that the states did not form the Union, the Union formed the states. So the Union was older than the states, he argued, therefore the states were never sovereign. And if you just think about that logically, it's the same as saying a marriage can be older than either spouse. 
because you know a marriage is a union, and how could a marital union be older than either spouse? It's, an impo it's a logical impossibility. Uh, the union of two things cannot be older than either of the two things. But that, that was Lincoln's theory, and I might as well put it on the screen here from the horse's mouth. Um, I'm going to eliminate something. Let's see, I don't want this, to... This is from, uh, well, it might be a little too small for you to read, but this is from uh, Lincoln's first inaugural address where he made the argument that the union is older than the states, therefore no such thing as state sovereignty ever existed. He said, the union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed by the Articles of Association. It was matured and continued by the Declaration of Independence. It was further matured by the Articles of Confederation. And finally, in 1787, one of the declared objects for the Constitution was to form a more perfect union. And so this, this German political uh, writer was paraphrasing that. That's exactly what he was paraphrasing in, in making his case for abolishing states' rights in Germany. Uh, a few other things that this writer said was that um, it would be desirable for Germany to, to, quote, eliminate states' rights altogether, since for us the state as such is only a form, but, but the essential is its content, the nation, the people, the whole people. There's that whole people argument. It is clear that everything else must be subordinated to its sovereign interests, its meaning the national government, in particular, we cannot grant to any individual state within the nation and the state representing it, state sovereignty and sovereignty in point of political power. Then he goes on to say, the mischief of individual federated states must cease and will someday, and will someday cease. Okay, let's see, I don't know though. I guess that's about all I'll read from that. Okay, well, any idea who I, who I might be talking about? Isn't yeah, I've been quoting from Mein Kampf. This was all Adolf Hitler uh, saying these things, even the quoting, quoting Lincoln's first inaugural address. So there was a section in Mein Kampf about uh, uh, state sovereignty that I've been reading from. If anybody wants the uh, footnotes, I'd be glad to, uh, to give them to you at some point. You know, I got onto this because during my debate with Harry Jaffa, uh, I knew he would do this, but because I, he, he did this when he debated uh, Mel Bradford and other people, by insinuating with sort of some weasel word language that you're a Nazi. If you oppose my view of Lincoln, you're a Nazi. And so, but, but the sort of the weaselly way he does it is uh, the way he did it, uh, it's in his latest book, and he pulled this on me during our debate. There was a, uh, a former Nazi named Rauschning who supposedly said that Hitler once said that it was a shame that the South lost the American Civil War be, uh, because they had, a, they had the right idea about race relations. So here's a former Nazi who's not the most reliable person quoting, supposedly quoting Adolf Hitler himself. And this is in, uh, is in the, f the front of chapter three of uh, Jaffa's latest book, this sort of thing. And then he, he'll say, uh, well, therefore Di Lorenzo must agree with Adolf Hitler. That's, How's that, how's that for a brilliant act of logic? So, so, so he pulled this BS on me. I knew he would because he does this with everybody. Uh, he call, calls you hip Nazi or something like that. And so, but it just so happened that I remembered that uh, I, as an undergraduate, I had read Mein Kampf in a history class, a European history class. And I remember they had a, there was a section there on state sovereignty. So, I, so the next day I wrote this article on lewrockwell.com entitled uh, Harry Jaffa's Hitlerian Defense of Lincoln. And I put all this in there. I, I proved that it was really Adolf Hitler who agreed with Lincoln and Jaffa on the whole issue of states' rights. They're, they're the ones. They're, they're, the, they're the nationalists and the centralizers, not, uh, not me. I'm opposed to all this stuff. And so, uh, so if anybody is a Hitlerite, it's, it's these guys. But that's, that's the sort of the uh, sleazy, dishonest type of argumentation you get from these uh, certain characters like, like this. But uh, anyway, so, so um, the point of all this, uh, the second part of my talk here, is, is that uh, through the intellectual history of this is that there have been a lot of uh, uh, libertarians uh, over the years who have understood this.
that um, divided sovereignty is necessary. If you're going to have government, you need to have divided sovereignty if there's only any hope of preserving some semblance of freedom. And so if not, you're going to have centralized tyranny like we, uh, like we have today, and we're all essentially slaves uh, to, to, the, uh, to the IRS for the, for the most part uh, today, and that's what we've got. And so uh, maybe I'll stop there. That's about all I wanted to say about what's...